Justice. I'm now joined by Howard Davies, the chairman of the London School of Economics and Politics. Thank you so much for joining us now. And it does seem, of course, that the UK is almost taking its cue from what's happening in Greece. They're scared that there will be bond vigilantes out there. Are they right to be scared? Well, at the moment, the gilt market has been reasonably stable. The government has been able to sell its debt. I think the market has been particularly focused on the southern European countries. And in a sense, we've had uh, comfort from the trouble in Greece has allowed us to carry on. So I don't think we're in that position. But on the other hand, I think this is just a first small down payment on the adjustments that we have to make on both the spending and the taxing side. What happens if we do lose our AAA credit rating because these cuts aren't strong enough? Well, that would be serious in terms of the cost of our debt in the long run. I don't think that's imminent. I think the Chancellor's calculation must be that if he shows some determination today, even though what he's doing today, of course, is tiny. I mean, this is 4% of the deficit, less than 1%, way less than 1% of public spending is being cut today. So this isn't really a serious announcement in terms of the scale of the problem, but I guess that it is a sign to the markets that, you know, he does have agreement within the coalition to do nasty things. And I guess it shows that actually he's committed to cutting the budget deficit. Would you cut more of the budget deficit? Because it seems that if we stay at these levels, it might not be enough, but if we do more, then do we risk losing the recovery? Yes, I would have cut more. I think the last government was irresponsible in its last uh, six months in terms of keeping the taps on, which I don't think they should have done. Um, but I think probably the Chancellor agrees with me, and I think he's probably going to do it, but obviously in a coalition government, and you need a proper spending plan. You, know, you need a clear focus and a clear profile of future spending. So just slashing and burning overnight is probably not what you need. Now, Howard Davis, I wanted to show your book. This has just come out, Banking on the Future, the Fall and Rise of Central Banking. And these guys are in a very, very tricky place. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't have written probably a more topical uh, uh, book. Trichet is doing everything he can to contain the crisis. Is he right to do so, or will that come back to bite him on the longer term? Well, I think there are some problems being stored up. I mean, I have a huge amount of sympathy for Jean-Claude Trichet in this crisis because he is attempting, if you like, to offset structural weaknesses in the monetary union, which in fact we set out in the, in the book, that you've set up a monetary union but without the fiscal policies uh, or the European monetary fund, if you like, to cope with times of crisis. So the ECB is having to do rather more than it ideally should do. And the problem, I think, is that we've now exposed that there are differences within the Council of the ECB. The last decision, Trichet said very clearly, was a majority decision. And that's a tricky precedent for the future, because there is, in fact, an inbuilt majority on the ECB Council of the smaller countries because they have a quite disproportionate share of the vote by comparison with the Fed, for example, where the central part of the Fed dominates the regions. In Europe, it's the other way round. And that could be very dangerous in the future if and when they want to begin to tighten policy. They could have resistance from a lot of countries who are still in trouble. So I'm afraid a Pandora's box has been opened up here. And I think that the Eurozone needs to put in place some structural changes to strengthen the monetary union and not rely on the central bank to do it all. And possibly envisage one of the countries leaving the euro, if only temporarily? Well, I think the key thing is whether people have to restructure their debt. My own hunch is that the Greeks will have to do that in due course. I can't quite see how they're going to get out of this hole. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to leave the euro. You could still say, look, we're only going to pay you 60 cents on the euro for your debt, but we're still going to pay it in euros. So I don't think it necessarily means countries should leave if they have to restructure their debt. And I think that's what I would regard as the most likely outcome. What can the G20 do in this European mess, if anything? I think the G20, not a lot. The IMF can help, and indeed it is helping. Um, the Europeans were, I think, too slow to accept the IMF's assistance. They said right at the beginning, we don't need the IMF. In fact, they quite clearly, they did need the IMF. And I think that was a big mistake that they made at the outset. Because if you either put in place proper European institutions to cope with these problems, or you have to use the IMF. And you can't you know, do, do neither. Um, but the G20, 
I think, well, what they're doing is plugging away at longer-term reforms to bank capital, to put more stability into the system. That's excellent stuff. It's being led, actually, largely by UK officials. Uh, but that's the most important thing. Sir Howard Davis, thank you so much. And that new book, Banking on the Future, the Fall and Rise of Central Banking. Thank you so much for joining us.